um, we've got a fair few people um, in the webinar now. So again, welcome to everyone. Um, this is, I think, the third webinar we've, we've run in the last nine months. Um, we've talked about COVID, we've talked about um, the US election, and now something of hot topic, I think Tim will agree, is inflation and what's happening with central banks around the globe. Um, and then we're gonna go into that today. So firstly, I'm just gonna introduce you to who will be speaking today. Um, it's gonna be myself. Um, I've been working in, in FX for about eight years now. I've been with Ebree for three. I finished a, um, a degree in applied finance and economics um, and I'm finishing my master's of political economy at the University of Sydney. For a lot of people that know me, they know I love my golf. And if you ever get me on the phone, I'll always be talking about golf. Um, and Timmy, did you want to say something about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been working um, in the financial industry for eight years as well. Uh, first in a bank, BNP Paribas, followed by Ibri. Um, I completed a master's degree in finance uh, with a few exchange programs in, uh, in India and Canada. Um, so I've been working in Ibri six years, four years in, in Amsterdam slash Brussels. And I've been in Hong Kong for the past two years. And as a fun fact, yeah, I've lived in over in eight countries so far. As we'd say, he's been everywhere, man, right? <laughs> um, cool. Um, so this is what we're going to be talking about today. First, we're going to give you an overview on what's been happening from a COVID perspective. Uh, we'll talk about how the economy has bounced back. Uh, then we'll talk about inflation and central banks and how that's impacted currencies around the globe. So let's have a look at it. Um, what we want to know out of today, right, is what is driving the currency market. Um, three things that we could say have been driving the currency market. A, it's been the vaccine rollout over the last, call it six months. It's been great that we've got the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine rolled out to most nations worldwide. And that's going to pose, uh, or that will set the ground for us to reopen the global economy. And with that global reopening, we're seeing inflation rise. Um, and with inflation, we're seeing central banks coming in to say, hey, isn't this inflation... Uh, transitory or is it here to stay um, and then what we're going to talk about today is I guess these three things how central banks are reacting to the current inflation pressures Next. Whoa. okay um, so what we've seen over the last call it 12 months or since COVID started we've seen a big fall in the USD the USD has traditionally been a, a safe haven currency a currency that investors lead to at, at times of, um, I guess, uncertainty. Um, but what we've seen as we've slowly come out of pandemic rules is the, um, the US has sold off against most currencies. Against the, the euro and the pound, we've seen it come off quite a fair bit. Um, and there are a few things that have been driving that. Um, the economic recovery has been a push towards a, a risk on sentiment. So everyone's more positive that we're gonna be flying around and, and trading internationally sooner rather than later. Um, everyone's concerned about the US inflation rate as well. Um, they, um, more than others, have been impacted by the rise of prices. Um, and Fed members have continued to, to not really do anything about anything uh, with inflation, um, with rate hikes still a long way away. And compared to, I guess, most nations, the US died really well in terms of vaccinations. However, they've come back quite a fair bit from there. Um, Tim's going to talk about it in a bit more detail later on. Um, but yeah, they haven't really kept up the pace of vaccinations that we expected, expected them to do. Um, like I said, safe haven currencies haven't exactly been doing the best. As much as it seems like risk is off at the moment, um, what the markets are telling us, it's, it has been risk on. The Aussie's been performing well, the CAD's been performing well, and the Kiwi's performing well and other currencies like the NOC, right? That, that's really related to oil and oil's back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. It's amazing. Um, I think in, in March and April, all the futures were nearly negative. Right now they're at really, really all time highs. If you go to the pump now in Aussie, I think you're paying about $1.80 um, a liter in fuel, which is quite expensive. Um, and to spoil all that, I mean, everyone's seeing, you know, risk on views. Um, we're seeing that in, in the bond market and we're seeing that in equities as well. Um, I think the ASX hit a record high about a week or two ago, seven and a bit thousand, uh, which has been positive. And then everyone's supporting this, this global reopening. Um, and then we see that continuing for the, the near future. Um, so what's happening in COVID news? 
Um, I'll start off with a bit of Aussie chat. These slides are a little bit dated now with what's happening here in, in Sydney and Bondi. Um, but as a high level overview, um, we've hit the 6 million um, number in, in terms of vaccines around Australia. Um, however, we are below where we need to be. I, I, I was reading that we wanted to be fully vaccinated by about October. At the rate that we're going at, at the moment, we won't see full vaccination until about June next year. Um, and also we're seeing you know, a, a new cases come up in Victoria only a few weeks ago and now in, in Bondi yesterday, I believe. Having a look there, um, you can see that on the, the trend line on the left, um, the original goal was to have everyone vaccinated by October. I think we're about halfway, if that, in terms of where we need to be. Um, and compared to the rest of the world, Aussies just lag behind a little bit. Um, if we do get that number up higher, if we get more people vaccinating, um, I do think that's going to lead toward, towards us opening borders a little bit more, um, which means you know, global trade will be a lot easier, more tourism, um, and possibly a rise in the Aussie. Tim, what do you think is happening in, um, in vaccine news in the US? Um, yeah, I think it's more relevant to talk about it in the US, right? As much as I'd like to talk about vaccination in Hong Kong, um, since the performance of the, of the Hong Kong dollar is linked to the US one, it's way more relevant to talk about the US and the, they've been doing very well uh, uh, with the vaccination, as you mentioned earlier, uh, with Biden uh, managing his, his bet on vaccinating more than 100 million people in his first uh, 100 days. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is that the, the, we, we see very high levels of vaccine hesitancy. So uh, um, it poses a big threat to the US in terms of reaching herd immunity, even though you know they've been relaxing the rules um, and most of the restrictions in the US right now, you're allowed to... Uh, to, to, to walk around without a mask and uh, just like you guys actually in, um, in, uh, in Australia. It's oh, definitely not, for, not, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, it depends on where you're, but it's definitely not, not, not the case in Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, so, so the, the pace of vaccination has collapsed in the US to 2.3, uh, 400 people per day. Um, so it seems like people are actually, you know, believing that, that they're over with it, uh, uh, which, which is not the case because the US, I believe right now has, around 50% of the people fully vaccinated, less than 50%. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to see what, uh, you, know, you know, how things evolve in the next, uh, in the next month. Uh, if they become like the UK, UK having only 12% of the, of the people uh, not willing to, to be vaccinated at all uh, versus 28% for the US, which is one of, uh, yeah, among the highest uh, safe friends at 34%. All right. So I guess moral to story, more vaccines would be great for everyone, right? It would. <laughs> um, I think we're going to go in now and, and talk about, in, in a holistic view, how, how well the, the economy is recovering, right, Timmy? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so the economy globally is performing, like the, the, the main economic uh, areas are performing quite well, right? We see, uh, we see the, um, the US leading the way, uh, almost like 70% in the uh, purchasing manager index, which is a, it's an indicator that we really like uh, because it gives you a monthly indication of how the economy is doing well, is doing in terms of manufacturing and services. Um, so obviously, we've seen the service sector lagging behind uh, uh, over the past uh, over the past few months for all the economies. Um, but all in all, we see uh, we see big economies like the US, uh, uh, the UK, and even Euro right now picking up as well. And it does bode well for the uh, for the global economic recovery, right? Um, so we now have the IMF expecting 6% growth in 2021. And this is to compare with 3.5% contraction in 2020 uh, with COVID. Um, and an interesting fact as well is that we, we see most of the central banks lately uh, uh, raising their projections for GDP growth in 2021 and 2022. Um, so we'll come back to this afterwards, but it, it's an interesting trend that we see in, um, in, uh, in major central banks. Yeah, so I guess, can you say that we're back, Timmy? Um, not yet, but we're definitely getting there. Definitely okay. getting there. Um, so what's happening in the US? Um, US obviously best performing, uh, uh, economy. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just going to mute you uh, or if you can mute yourself, uh, Patty, because I'm hearing myself, uh, best performing, uh, G3 economy. Uh, of course, you know, China has been doing very, very well. So, uh, so we will come back to this afterwards as well, but. But the U.S. has been doing exceptionally well and, and much better than, uh, than anticipated. 
uh, with most of the restrictions being lifted um, as early as the start of the year with uh, you know, the uh, vaccination pace uh, really picking up. Also some stimulus checks uh, uh, being, being given to support personal income. Um, though we are seeing some supply constraints uh, holding back you know, the, the output and, and pushing up prices. So you know, we've seen the uh, toilet paper, which was very transitory. Uh, but apart from toilet paper, like the the the, the, the lumber, so uh, you know it's it's an interesting uh, event actually. So the, the lumber prices um, were multiplied by four in the U.S. It is due to the uh, uh, you know housing sector really picking up, but also the 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 this sector not being ready for the surge in price, and you know all this craze that we've seen post pandemic, where people wanted to live you know more in the countryside and actually have more wood materials. Uh, um, it's been an interesting, uh, interesting topic lately because it is having an impact on the uh, on the on the on the whole housing market in the U.S. Uh, we've also seen the uh, the chip market, right? So uh, uh, yeah, electrical uh, chip, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And and now it's impacting the the automotive sector massively in Europe. Uh, in the U.S., Tesla, uh, uh, you know, announced that it would delay production because of the chips. Uh, uh, you know, not being able to um, to get chips from uh, from uh, from Asia, from Taiwan, from from China. Um, so it is a challenge uh, that we're seeing in many industries, and, and a challenge for the uh, for the for the months to come. We're also seeing some uh, yeah labor market uh, uh, still has to recover. Uh, uh, so the the March, the April and May uh, non-farm payroll were very disappointing, um, and you know we've seen like those uh, uh, those companies like McDonald's, uh, you know, trying to recruit. I think they they need to hire ten thousand people. Uh, like very very shortly, and they've raised the hourly wage to t by ten percent in the uh, in the US, and they expect the hourly wage to be at fifteen dollars uh, in twenty twenty four. So the 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 job openings are at the highest ever in the US, uh, but they can't find anyone. Uh, uh, and there are a few reasons for it, right? The, the one of the reasons may be that the uh, the there were very generous unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, so you know all these all these checks, all these money given to uh, to unemployed people. Um, also, many schools are still closed, and and the workers are unable to find uh, childcare. Right? If you need to take care of your of your children, then you can't go to work, uh, and you're not gonna you're not gonna look for for a job yourself. Uh, and also a bit of worker relocation. Um, so companies find out that they uh, the employees work very well uh, when they're not here, um, and then why not relocating? Uh, you know. Uh, Workforce in other countries where it's cheaper. Um, so we still have only 65% of the net job that have recovered since the start of the pandemic. Um, so that's roughly 7.2 million uh, jobs in um, in the US right now. Uh, in terms of consumer spending, they're still doing very well. Um, so we still like we see the retail sales in uh, in April uh, that were revised at 10.7%. It's just uh, massive. And it's a 50, 50, 51%, sorry, year on year jump. Uh, but of course we have to consider the fact that those data are, have a base effect in 2020, right? So we're comparing those data with, with, uh, with a very, very, very low, uh, um, economic data that we had in 2020. Um, and we also seeing the, the consumer, uh, uh, well supported by Biden plan, right? The 1.9 trillion stimulus package signed off in March. Uh, very controversial, right? Because the uh, the Republicans were not uh, um, were against this plan. Uh, we've seen direct payments of up to fourteen hundred dollars to uh, to individuals in uh, in the U.S. I think it was every individual uh, earning less than seventy thousand uh, dollars a year, uh, and also additional uh, uh, three hundred dollars a week unemployment insurance supplement, uh, which is you know as we mentioned just earlier, one of the reasons why uh, um, people are not going back to work. So how is it going in the in Australia actually, uh, uh, Sticky? Um, in in Aussie, it's a bit different, right? I mean, I, I think we or the federal government protected jobs very well, um, and and had a, a very good welfare program. It started with the the job seeker um, and the job keeper program during the pandemic. Um, I believe the job keeper uh, program is about to finish up, um, and now they've got the job maker program as well. Um, so. We held jobs very well. I think unemployment now is back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and just as recently as this week, um, the, the federal government have agreed to, to raise the minimum wage as well, similar to what they did in the US. So uh, I'm, I'm very positive in terms of where we're tracking. Um, I, I think we're gonna talk about this later on, but the big thing that everyone's looking out for is wage growth. Um, 
and shifting away from those welfare payments, right? We want people, um, you know, being productive um, and wage is a big thing. Uh, what do you think, Timmy? I think that that's consensus across the globe. If wages yeah, exactly. pick up, the, um, you know, that labor market operate at capacity, um, which would stimulate the growth that we're seeing in a positive way. Uh, exactly. It's, it's what we've been seeing in the US. And we had a good question uh, here in the chat from, uh, from Robbie about the labor wage increase subsidized by, uh, by the US government. That's exactly it, right? Uh, if people are, are earning money, it's actually funny because it's a, it, it's a problem that we've seen in Europe, you know, with the government uh, uh, and the ECB subsidizing the whole economy. So, so you know, uh, supporting companies that actually are not performing well. And it was something that we didn't have in the US before. Um, and now we see the US facing, you know, that, that, that challenge uh, because people are basically not working and still being paid for it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no incentive to go back to work. No, exactly. And you make money, you spend money, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So what's happening over there in the Eurozone? Yeah. So Eurozone, it's, it's funny, you know, we, we, we were thinking originally that, that the, the Europe would be following the US, you know, a bit, probably a bit later, right? So, so with a little bit of lag, but we didn't expect such a lag to happen. And, and that's, uh, you know, the reason why we saw the, the, the Euro dollar, um, you know, uh, so that the Euro underperforming the dollar at the start of the year. So we went as low as 117 on Euro dollar. Uh, and that was very much due to the, uh, you know, to the activity uh, lagging. So, so the restrictions have been extended uh, in most European countries. Uh, they're just trying to lift off right, right, right now, you know, but like we, we even had the restrictions being prolonged, uh, uh, I think it was announced two days ago, right, in the UK uh, for another four weeks. Um, and, you know, it's, it's due to this very slow pace of vaccination that, that we've had in Europe. Okay, UK is an exception because they've been doing very, very, very well, actually better than the US originally, uh, uh, but Europe has been very much lagging behind. And that's, that's the reason why uh, uh, it took so long for them to actually um, to actually get there, and it, it's slowly getting there. So, so we're seeing the uh, the, the the PMI in um, in uh, in Europe. You can go on to the next slide. The PMI in Europe actually picking up right now. Uh, consumer confidence coming back, um, and yeah, all this actually gives us confidence in the uh, in the euro and the eurozone for the uh, for the coming quarters. Uh, so we'll have the data for for Q2 and Q3. Sorry, for Q2 in July. Uh, um, be interesting to see, uh, uh, you know, how, how Europe is going to perform because we've seen interesting data in terms of uh, uh, PMI in manufacturing and also services uh, with, of course, like the, uh, the restrictions easing. Like most countries back to pre-pandemic levels, eh? Yeah, or even higher, actually. You know, like the, uh, the, the US was above 60. Um, yeah. So, you know, 50 is, is uh, above 50 is expansion and, and below 50 is contraction. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've seen consistent, uh, uh, you know, We've been the numbers being consistently above 50 for the past uh, for the past few months, which really bodes well but for the uh, for the recovery. I guess the question's always: Is it transitory? Is it That's here to stay? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we're going to the next de next part of the presentation. We're going to be talking about um, inflation in general, what's driving it, in a bit more detail, and then we'll talk about what the central banks will do about it. Um, and like we said earlier, and like what Timmy's been talking about. Um, the big driver of inflation at the moment is um, the, the global reopening, right? Um, and as we've seen, as we've reopened this year, we've seen a, a sharp jump in terms of um, purchasing and expenses, right? Now, the central banks need to deal with it. So what we'll look at is what they're dealing with. So a few things have been driving prices higher. Um, the first thing we could um, point to is very accommodative fiscal and monetary policies. What does that mean? It means governments open their wallet. It means central banks drop the interest rates. Um, there was a lot of stimulus, stimulus at the start of last year to keep businesses afloat, to keep people spending, and to make sure that we had an economy to come back to after the, the pandemic. Um, and central banks across the globe dropped the interest rates to either zero or, or very low. I think we're still at 0.1% here in Aussie, um, and the likelihood of that, that changing um, could, could be um, anything, right? We're still seeing interest rates low for an extended period, but we'll talk about that um, in, in a few more slides. Also, since we're all locked down, we weren't spending money. What we're seeing is a sharp rise of spend from individuals as they come out of the lockdown period. Uh, we saw that in New Zealand, we saw it in Aussie, 
now we're seeing it over there in the Eurozone in the US as they were the last ones to come out of the, the global lockdown. Um, and then to contribute to that, we're seeing commodity prices rise as well. Um, iron ore is up at 220 a tonne. That's really supported the Australian economy, but it also puts a dent in terms of manufacturing and, and um, global prices as a whole. Um, and what's happened through the lockdown, right, is a lot of production have closed or were closed. Um, and we're just getting back into production again. So we're still struggling to keep up with that pent up demand. If supply is here, demand's over here, and that just hasn't met each other yet. And a big thing about inflation right now is the low base effect. We're coming off really weak economic figures from 2020 um, to really positive um, figures at the first end of, of 2021, which is really just exponentiating the, um, the rise of prices. Um, yeah, so something you could look at. Um, last week, we saw headline inflation come out at 5% year on year. It's the highest level since kind of that, that post um, GFC period there. Um, and we've seen core inflation rise up to 3.8%, highest since the mid 90s. Um, it's very hot right now in the US. Everyone's spending, PMIs are up above 50 at the moment as well. Um, and it, it's just something to take note of. There is money out there, there is spend out there, it's just being shifted towards other services and other products. Um, I think we're seeing the same thing in China. Correct me if I'm wrong, Timmy. Um, yeah, totally. But, yeah. it, was, it was very, very interesting to see the, uh, the producer price index last week soaring to 9%, uh, which is much higher than, uh, than anticipated. Uh, but we do believe that, you know, you just mentioned the iron ore uh, reaching $220 per, per ton. And, and it's the same also with oil, right? The oil above $70 a barrel, uh, many banks forecasting above $80 a barrel by this summer. Goldman Sachs is, is one of them. Um, and and we, we believe that, you know, this is transitory. Um, so basically, we don't see any banks, uh, any central banks hiking rates uh, in 2021 in Asia, in the region. So we're only talking about APAC here. Um, because, you know, if oil actually goes back to $70, $70 a barrel, which is, you know, you were mentioning it's pre-pandemic level and iron ore, uh, um, actually iron ore is an interesting subject uh, uh, because you've, I know you've heard, right now, pretty, but... yeah, you've, you've pretty heard about yeah. this, uh, this um, you know, mine in China that closed two days ago uh, uh, and they closed it for, um, for at least a month or something like this. So it's 40,000 tons a day less. So obviously this is driving prices up, right? Uh, but you know, it's it's only going to be transitory. So the 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 the, the dollar, the, sorry, the, the price that we're seeing right now on iron ore at two twenty dollars a ton may be sustained for a few weeks, um, but then toward the end of the year it should go down. And and same with freight, right? Uh, freight prices. Uh, yeah. It's also been it's also been driving uh, prices up, and uh, and we th we we see this as transitory, and and such as you know like the the. The, actually, the whole sector is, is believing that, you know, by the end of the year or 2022, we should see freight prices going down. Um, so, so this is why, like most central banks, should actually stand pat uh, uh, until the end of the year. I think we're, uh, we're seeing common trend to me. Uh, inflation is transitory at the moment. I think we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are central banks going to do? Um, I'm going to start off. I'll talk about the RBNZ and the RBA. Um, the Antipodian central banks, and then Timmy's going to take over and, and talk about the US um, and the Eurozone, the ECB. Um, so here in the RBA, um, again, common to what we were talking about earlier, they've, they've really shrugged off inflation. Um, they haven't really been too concerned about it. They haven't really talked about it too much. Um, they actually did put it in their most recent minutes. Um, a few things to note from them is, uh, in, interest rates are going to stay low for as long as necessary. They still see that interest rates need to be accommodated for an extended period um, to sustain the growth that we're seeing right now, despite them being surprised by how much the, um, the economy has bounced back. Um, they did note in the last minutes that inflation's going to temporarily rise above 3%. Again, holding that theme of tem uh, temporary or transitory inflation but for any significant move in interest rates or for them to actually do anything, they want to see wages up at 3%. So common themes here is we're seeing inflation as something we're only seeing for probably this year. Um, and we need wages to catch up. We need to see people making more money on the dollar 
uh, making sure they're, they're able to sustain an increase of interest rates to service loans and an increase of prices. So our view is we don't expect that the RBA is going to change rates anytime soon. The earliest we expect them to do change or to change rates is 2023. Um, but we do expect them to start easing back on that QE policy that they've maintained um, through that COVID level uh, with the market pricing and about a 70 to 80% chance that the YCC, the three year YCC that they've had for a while to not be extended. Um, and you could probably expect that in, in next month's announcement. Over across the ditch, um, the RBNZ, for the first time, I think in nearly a year um, that they've released their official cash rate forecast. What is that? It's their, um, it's basically their view on, on where they think interest rates are going to be. For a long time, um, they kept interest rates accommodative, right, to, to make sure that businesses over there can live or can survive through that low, low business period through the lockdown. Um, but again, they're not concerned about inflation pressures. Uh, what's really driving them to have any move in, in, in interest rates is the labour market and the housing market at the moment. Um, in terms of figures, I think unemployment's still at, at about 4.6 or 4.7%. They want to see that closer to that 4.2, 4.3%, a few more people in jobs. Um, and the big hot topic right now, if anyone here is from New Zealand, um, they'd know is um, from COVID levels, we've seen that the, um, the housing market has boomed. Um, Auckland prices have doubled, I think, or close to doubled, something like that. Um, and that really needs to be pulled back in, needs to be controlled. Um, a few things have been introduced. I think there's new LVR rules with regards to what you can borrow against a property. And also there's a, a debt to income um, ratio that's being introduced. Uh, making sure that you know people can service their loans and not you know over over buying in the housing market. So our our expectation from the RBNZ is look they might be the first to raise interest rates, um, but not from inflation issues, but mainly from you know the, the housing market and and uh, making sure that that doesn't get out of control. Um, so that being said, I I do see the Kiwi uh, um, rising against the dollar um, over the next twelve months. Um, leaning on them being the first to come out of the pandemic. FOMC. So um, you all know that the you know the market had been waiting for for this event to um, to happen. It finally did. It was a main. It was a big event and it was a market mover. Um, so basically, the the FOMC member were very very dovish uh, for the past few months. Uh, in March, you know, they said that it was not even time to talk about tapering. Um, and we got the impression from their meeting yesterday that they're actually starting to talk about tapering. Uh, so we're looking to, to get some information around this, maybe towards the end of the year, so towards September or maybe the December meeting. Um, and what's interesting in the meeting that we had yesterday, and one of the reasons why, you know, like Euro dollar went back to 120, uh, dollar CNY uh, reached actually 6.44 uh, uh, this morning. Um, and the reason for this was like uh, we had some FOMC members uh, uh, changing the dot plot, right? So, so actually bringing forward the projections for, for the Fed hiking rates in 2023. So now we see two uh, uh, rate hikes in 2023. Well, before that, the, the earlier uh, rate hikes uh, projections were in 2024. Um, and the reason for that, and it's a similar story with, uh, with what you mentioned earlier, Patrick, right? Like we, we see like the... Uh, the, the GDP growth uh, uh, forecast being raised. Uh, so for the US, it was raised from 6.5% to 7%. So they were mentioning in March 2020, uh, 2021 at the previous meeting, they were mentioning that the, uh, the, the GDP growth for, for 2021 would be 6.5%, uh, it's now 7%. For the inflation, it was 2.2%, it's now 3%. Um, and the unemployment rate, they see it at 4.5% at the end of the year. Uh, but it is still the biggest concern, right? And they, they've been saying many times that the, uh, the, the, the monetary policy is, is purely based on the economic outcomes and not on the, on the calendar, right? So, uh, so we don't see them doing anything uh, until 2023. Uh, and we're still very uh, pessimistic on the dollar uh, uh, for, the coming, uh, for the coming quarters. As for the uh, euro, uh, so ECB, no rush to tighten. I think we can agree, Patrick, that if there's one central bank that will be the last to hike, that's the ECB, right? Christina I, think, has I been... think the guard will not, yeah, she won't show her hand. I think they'll be the last ones to do anything. They've been super dovish uh, uh, 
we had inflation at two percent. Uh, that data we got like last week or the week before, two uh, mm-hmm. percent uh, uh, inflation. But the core inflation remains at zero point nine percent, which is very, you know, it's 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 well short of the of the ECB target that is just below two percent. Um, we are still bullish on the euro uh, uh, for a few reasons, and and those reasons are the ECB opposition to a stronger euro. Uh, they've been talking, you know, there've been a few members of the of the ECB mentioning that the euro was too strong, um, and also the high yields uh, that may cap uh, cap the gains. Cool. Now, uh, if we um, have some insight on the emerging market currencies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So give us your insights, Timmy. The market still considers. Sorry, can you mute yourself? Yeah, perfect. Uh, the market still considers the uh, the CNY to be an emerging market currency. Um, so you know, for the sake of of this, uh, we're still gonna we're still gonna consider it an emerging market one. But like the uh, the yeah, we all agree that this soon gonna break out of this uh, of this Very emerging market high. currency. Um, what what is it against the dollar now? It's it's that's against the dollars. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, now it's six point four, six point four two. And dropping, oh, and the dollar dropping in the same way, yeah. rising. Yeah. So the uh, the chart on the right, you know, you, you can see all the all the different emerging market currencies against the dollar. Uh, so obviously they've been like, you know, it's, it's been very uh, idiosyncratic. So some performing very well uh, against the dollar. I'm talking about the BRL, you know, for, for the biggest one, BRL, CNY, and Russian rubble, uh, and some performing very bad. So the uh, the 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 Turkish lira, but it's mostly due to the uh, to the uh, geopolitics, so uh, so Erdogan actually firing the uh, ECB ECB governor, um, but also you know some uh, so, some countries uh, on on the left hand side, so uh, Peru, uh, Colombia, Thailand, uh, uh, with it's mostly due to the to the vaccination pace, right? Uh, um, so so we've seen those those economies performing quite bad, and as a result, these the the currencies performing quite bad as well. We thought that 2020 would be the year of uh, of emerging market currencies. Uh, but we actually think that now there's a lot of room for 2021 to be the year of emerging market currencies. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of central banks in those uh, in those countries uh, hiking rates. Speaking of Brazil, speaking of uh, uh, Russia, um, and we do believe that this will be a driver because uh, for other emerging market currencies as well, because we do expect other central banks emerging markets to uh, to hike rates as well. So we believe that this would be a driver for uh, for emerging market currencies. To um, yeah, to have further gains in uh, in 2021, along with commodity prices rebounding, um, and also yeah, the vaccine rollouts uh, are being being uh, being better in those countries. Biden and and other G7 countries have agreed last uh, last week uh, to give one billion uh, uh, doses of uh, vaccine to developing nations. So that that will definitely be a boost for um, for those uh, for for their currencies. Oh no, I think we're. Um... We're on track. I mean, it looks like the economy is bouncing back on the global front. Um, but what do you think, Timmy? What, what drivers do we need to see? Um, vaccine rollouts, um, everyone vaccinated. What, what needs to happen? Well, the uh, the vaccine rollout is definitely one thing, right? Uh, the, the faster the vaccination pace, the faster the recovery. Uh, mm-hmm. It's what we've been seeing in, in all major economies. Uh, look at China. China had a sick vaccination pace. Uh, everything has been normal in China since May last year, right? If you're in China, if you've been living in China since May last year, you haven't seen the impact of the pandemic. They've been doing very good. Um, so vaccination pace is, is definitely uh, the, the biggest driver for now. Um, but also the, um, yeah, the central bank reactions I've been seeing, right? Uh, um, central bank hiking uh, has, the, has the, uh, the, the biggest impact on the on, on the currencies so who do you think is going to be the first uh, central bank to hike? yeah i guess i guess to finish off I, I would say i think the rbnz could be the first mover they were the first out of the pandemic i think they'll be the first to, to raise rates um but time will tell i think that's going to be a good 12 months from now what do you think i'm going to me? vote for the bank of england i think okay. they're the first ones they've, they've, lunch, they've but... released some hints over the past few weeks i believe they're, 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 they're going to be the first one to uh, to hike rates We'll see how we go. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for um, for joining us. Um, if there's any questions, just pop them in the. Um, there's a question box there in in the Zoom invite, and, and Timmy could probably read them out, and we could we could see which ones we can answer, and we'll um, we'll keep that there for a few minutes.
What questions do we have there, Tim? Um, we only have one for now, the one that we already answered from uh, from Robbie. Um, I mean, it was a very good comment as well like, regarding the, uh, you know, the, the, the labor wage increase subsidized by the, uh, by the U.S. government. Um, and yeah, we can all agree that, uh, that this plays a big role in, uh, in the slow recovery of the labor market in the U.S. I got one here from Pat, um, another Pat actually, um, asking where the currency is going to go, the Australian dollar. Um, I guess my view on the Aussie is as much as we, we've seen us dip below 77 cents and we've been range bound for the last, call it two, three months, um, there's every chance that we could be above, you know, close to 80 cent mark. Um, I'm still very bearish on the USD. I don't think they've got everything sorted over there. So, no, I think the Aussie it has a, some room to go. I think there's one more question here, Tim, um, just around dollar RMB. Where do you think dollar RMB is going to go? Timmy? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as we said, you know, uh, uh, over the past half hour, we we, we put on, the, on, on the dollar. We're quite dumbish right. on the dollar. We, we, we think the dollar is going to depreciate. Uh, and Ibris view that dollar RMB will reach 625 by the end of the year. And, uh, and we are actually going to go towards six next year. So Oof. this, you know, this Big will move. not be transitory. Yeah. No, China, is China, is doing, China is doing very well. And, and, you know, the PBOC is not looking like they're going to, they're going to intervene on the market uh, uh, because there are all the, you know, all the tensions and, and all, the, all the topics at stake. Um, so we don't believe that they're gonna they're gonna act on the uh, you know on trying to counter the uh, the RMB appreciation. Um, so we believe that this would be actually structural. All right. So weaker US transitory inflation and rate hikes. I guess we can summarize. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Tim. Do you want to do you want to answer the last question from Robbie? Oh, what's the Regarding last question? Free trade deal between England and Australia. Oh, that's going to be interesting. Um, so I guess a few things that only just came out last week. Um, the big thing is with regards to meat and cattle, um, I think there's going to be quite a big boom. Um, as much as, I guess, a lot of our meat exports have gone to um, China for, you know, God knows, for the last 10, 15 years. I think that's going to be subsidised now by the demand out of the, um, out of the UK. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be positive. I, I haven't gone into too much detail in terms of that trade deal. The other thing that's going to be positive is um, the ease for working visas um, from both nations. I think now um, English nationals working in Aussie don't need to do the farm work anymore. Um, we should see an influx of, of more, I guess, skilled English um, citizens coming into Aussie. Have you got right, it, Patrick? I think I think cool. we're good to go. I think we're good also to go. Really good right. on the time, right? Two forty-one. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Two forty-one in uh, in in Australia. Perfect. God. Need to hang up.